So I did a video about a week ago about PFSense and transparent bridging and how you can do intrusion detection. And I wanted to do a follow-up video to talk more specifically about the use case for that and how it works. So I'm gonna break this down specifically with an SG3100 running Sericata. Now the original idea for this and the project that a uh, client has contracted me to do was design this with Snort and not Sericata. Well, it was kind of my suggestion I thought it would work well. Turns out uh, this chokes on Snort but seems to run fine with Sericata. So this video is kind of to walk over the configuration, talk about the use case, talk about the implementation of this particular project. So what we have here is an SG3100. Why did we choose this? Well, the particular use case in this uh, project, what the client hired me for, is they're going to be deploying a large number of these to monitor very specific systems on their network, special control systems, and they want to be able to babysit them. And this is one of the things that some people go over the top with. They try to apply this to their own computers and things like that. And there's just a ton of connections going on. But when you're dealing with the business world, there's very specific connections and very specific filtering for those connections that you may want to do. And that's what this is going to break down, how to set that up and how to completely and specifically watch that filtering. Now with systems such as Sericata or any IDS system, one of the things it does is monitor routed traffic normally, because you run it inside your firewall. The way to not have it only monitor routed traffic would be to mirror a port and send it over. That can be very time consuming, but you can do it that way. And what I mean by that is when two devices are on the same network, so you're moving laterally within the network, not routing through the device, so the two IPs are in the same range, it just talks to each other. Your IDS has no way of seeing that unless you do, like I had said, an import mirror where you duplicate all that data and send it to an IDS system for inspection. In this case though, with transparent bridging, this allows us to easily monitor without changing any of the existing network infrastructure or setting up a port mirror. It does require an extra piece of hardware and that's why they chose the SG3100. And the question was, is it fast enough to route Will it work for this project? Turns out it will, as I stated, as long as you're using Sericata. So what we've done is turn the WAN port into the management port. So this will be managed by a separate network, separate range on the WAN. The WAN will have an IP address assigned to it. Then we have opt one. This is essentially our in. This is where the network feed will come in. And then over here, we have four ports. And we're gonna go over how we have these configured in a second. These four ports are all the same. It's just a, essentially a four port switch. That means one to four devices can all be monitored. Now, when you plug these in for monitoring, whether you were to take these two wires, even though they go through here for the transparent bridge, if you were to just connect them straight together, it would work perfectly fine in terms of like, it gets the same IP addresses. We're not doing any changing of IP. We're basically turning this into an observer, a transparent bridge of the traffic, and then feeding that traffic into the IDS system, which is gonna be Snort. And I'm gonna walk over that configuration and exactly how that works. So. With Snort, it's going to be able to see any of the traffic that comes here, but the devices themselves are blind to the fact that there was a change. So no IP ranges have to be changed on the devices. The, these literally just have to be dropped in. The only thing that has to be programmed is the WAN port to match whatever the management side is for each location that these are gonna be at. So they have access to it. Now further, but beyond the scope of this video, uh, I will show where the login goes. Uh, and you can dump these logs to an external server for monitoring and such. Uh, but the goal of this is to create very specific rules, essentially pinholes between the devices that are gonna be plugged into the four ports here and that. And what I mean by pinholes are they know what they need already. They already know the IP addresses. They know exactly what things should be allowed within the firewall and they want to exclude it to that. That way if uh, someone tried to attempt on the same network to try a different range of IPs or a different port than the control system is on, the system would just block it by default. Further, they also want to inspect the traffic with Sericata. So if the ports that are open are then also subjected to some other 
potentially malicious traffic that will also be logged and cataloged and they'll be able to inspect the traffic because maybe you don't always know if traffic is suspicious until you put it through something and it matches some type of pattern. So uh, let's get in and exactly go over the settings on this. So you now know the physical layer, which is pretty simple. WAN is management, OPT is there in, and then our four ports for up to four devices. I only have one device right here. It's my laptop and it's going to be the device that we're going to use for uh, just showing how the system uh, connects to it and kind of giving us some alerts so we can actually generate some noise on the log and show how it works. Well, let's dive into all the settings. Management was formerly the WAN interface, and what we've done is assigned it DHCP, and we'll click on it real quick. I just renamed it from WAN to management because technically it's not a WAN port anymore, but physically it's where we're plugged in to manage this device. And this is set to DHCP, but can be set to static, so we can have an assigned uh, static IP, so this can be managed, and this is how we will communicate with the box. Because as you notice here, we only have an IP address assigned to that particular interface. All the other ones do not occupy any IP space within the bridge. So here's those four LAN ports, and we did enable out of the box. This is the only thing different from stock, enabled opt one. So opt one enabled allow us to build the bridge. And let's talk about the bridge settings. So over here, assignments, bridge. So we turned on opt one. And we just created this LAN and OPT1 called a transparent bridge. Didn't There's all kinds of advanced settings you can do in bridges beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, we left all those at default. This, for the purposes of what this is going to do, just monitor that traffic. We don't need any of those advanced settings turned on. Then we go over here to interfaces, assignments, and we assign the bridge, the interface bridge. Now something else I did over here real quick Anti-lockout rule, we did disable that. And the reason why is because when you go over here to firewall rules, we have the management interface. This is how we plan to manage it. I've got SSH externally opened to management and we have a 443 so we can get to this web interface, which is how we're logged in now. Your LAN, I want no rules at all. Under opt, I want no rules at all. And I want only the bridge to be where I get all my rules from. That way from a clarity of how we're managing this device. Right now we have it set to wide open as in any port, any gateway, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead and go wherever. All we're doing is managing it wide open right now. But when we get specific, we only have to create rules and get granular inside this bridge. And the final way, the final little system tunable that was changed was under advanced system tunables, packet filter on bridge interface set to one. You can look this up. There's a write-up inside of PFSense, uh, their documentation on this. What this does, instead of having either the LAN or OPT be the interface by which you set those rules, this means put all the packet filtering on the bridge interface. Like I said, it's kind of just a clarity thing, so there's no confusion, and you know where your rules are. Now, the other things we have to do. We go over here, and we see bridge. That's what we're going to be over on Sericata monitoring. Sericata it's monitoring the bridge interface. Now let's look at it real quick here. First thing before we go in there, let me show you, and I covered this in my other video, but Sericata, because it does not have, and this is me just mousing over an alias so you can see what we're doing here, the bridge IP range aliases are important. So we created this called BridgeWatch. Let's edit it real quick. It's called BridgeWatch. IP addresses to watch over the bridge. And then this is just an alias. And you can click on the alias. I only have one. I'll show you how we created it real quick. But you have to monitor the IPs within that range because Sericata, although it will monitor the traffic, it will disregard the alerts if it doesn't know what to monitor. By default, Sericata looks at the local interfaces attached to the system and monitors them. So that's how it gets its IP ranges that should be monitoring. I added an alias called Bridge IP Range. You can go to Interfaces, do Edit. In Sericata, that's just set right here. Under Home Net, you change it to Bridge Watch because that's what I called it. And if we look over here under the aliases, you can see I have all the IPs related to everything under 192 free range. So anything in there. Now I could get specific and only put the IPs I wanted in there. And also I didn't have to hand type these. That's why it says entry created. Uh, Saturday, et cetera, et cetera. You can type in uh, slash 24 
or 23 or 22 or whatever you want. Um, and when you save it, it'll auto populate that entire subnet range without you having to hand type it. So however you want to monitor this, you can. Uh, I just do everything in the three range because I wanted to do a bunch of thorough testing to make sure the alerts were getting picked up. I also have this right here, which is the temperature monitor. And the reason for that is a few people commented that the SG3100 uh, gets kind of hot. And I wanted to say, not really. Uh, even with the testing and the updates and uh, pushing a bunch of data through this, and you can see I've already got alerts because I was testing it prior to the video, I haven't had an issue with it overheating. Matter of fact, if we let it idle and don't push data through it, it goes down pretty cool, uh, down to 139. This is the thermal sensor, not the whole bottom plate. You can still put your hand on the bottom of this, uh, and it's passively cooled, so it still works really well for that without causing an issue. Now let's dive into actually doing the tests. The first thing we want to do is SSH into our management port. Open up a shell, open up top, and we see Sericata sitting there. Now let's go over here and uh, log into my laptop. My laptop running through that transparent bridge, and then my computer is local right here. Let's just run iperf. SH. So iperf 3 server, and then we're going to go iperf 3 client line 21683.101. So you're seeing about 900 megs. Uh, not bad. Not It's just a slightly underlying speed, and it does push Sericata to about the 89% mark. Uh, watching all that traffic. Let's firewall. All right, services, Sericata. Look at the alerts. And there we go. We got some alerts. Stream of slash packet out of window 5201. What it's doing is it didn't understand some of the stuff, so it started seeing packet out of window. It started generating alerts. Now, as far as how I have Sericata configured in here, when you look at this, I did a pretty basic rule setup. So as far as categories and rules, I just grabbed all of them. There's no fine tuning done. I just grabbed the ET Emerge and the Snort GPL uh, rules, threw them in here, and just said select all of them, basically more than you probably want to know. But the goal is to be able to get the streams to start creating some data and then filter it back out because these have a very specific use case. Um, and there's always some amount of tuning you'll have to do of going through these alerts and deciding which ones are valid alerts, which ones are just going to be false positives, and going from there. I will comment as well for those wondering, well, how do you get the alerts out of the system? Uh, you can get them out a couple different ways. The easy way to do it, we go enable Barnyard 2. You can send them to Syslog, Bro IDS, even dump them to some type of SQL database. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this is like the monitoring side of this. But PF Sense does support external Syslog, both for specifically Sericata and globally for the PF Sense system itself. You can just go into the log system and externally export the logs under status system logs, settings, and uh, send it to a syslog server and dump whatever it is you want to dump the whole system or get specific and granular. Let's go back over here. And we do see that immediately jumped it up a couple degrees just by running that test on there. Uh, but it's still working. And we have some of these alerts from Sericata kicking off and going in here. Go back over to the alerts. What else does it see? Well, let's go over here. and. Uh, Clear the alerts, just so we don't have anything in there. Let's generate some new ones. So update my laptop real quick. Apt get update. All right, no no packages to install, but I'm feeling though. Definitely grabbed a bunch of stuff because some of it went out over port 80 to grab the updates and it says, hey, uh, GNU Linux apt user agent outbound likely related to package management. It's not suspicious traffic, but once again, when you turn all the rules on and say, watch everything, we're getting a lot of detail. And from the standpoint of being wanting to being the desired goal to watch one of these uh, machines that's going out to the network, you want to know everything about it because you it has a very specific purpose. Uh, and you want to make sure you're tracking everything on there. If you're trying to do this with your home computer or a uh, system, you're going to find just it kicks off alerts. If I just start using my laptop as like a regular user, you'll spend a lot of time doing this. But like I said, the goal of this is to go into very specific use cases on there. But as you can see here, it's really not taxing it too much. Now, I do know like iPerf is going to be 
less than ideal in terms of real world testing because it's just doing one specific stream, but you get the idea. It doesn't have a problem handling the traffic and it's capable of still routing at a very reasonable speed with the SG3100 with Sericata. Now, Snort, like I said, I tried this with Snort. Snort was all over the place and did have a lot of just hangups um, trying to do this. It just didn't seem to work as well on that processor. Now, let's talk about rules. We'll exit out so we're not breaking any sessions. Right now I can ping line two and six eight three dot one. I currently have the firewall completely shut down on my laptop for these demonstration purposes for those wondering. So easily I can ping it. And that also means if we go diagnostic here, let's go over to PF top. We're going to go to host one I two and six eight three dot one oh one. We can see everything that's connecting to it, including everything from nine here. So right there is the TCP UDP connections going out. Let's go ahead and ping it. And now we see the ICMP connections going there. So everything's working fine. And like I said before, the firewall rule is wide open. So it's allowing that. Go ahead and stop the ping. Then go here and edit. It say we don't want ping to be supported. We only want TCP connections. So specifically TCP only. Well, we'll go TCP UDP, so that will give me two demos here. Save. Now we've said only thing can go across here is TCP and UDP, which means SSH will work fine. So I can go over here, SSH right into that computer again, no problem. But if we try to ping it, ICMP has been blocked. So we're dropping that. So note four packets transmitted, zero received. Now, if you notice I have this on, let's look at this rule real quick. I do have it logging the rule and the logging the rule is that way we can go over here, go to firewall and see what is going on. If this is going to be matched or dropped. So right here, because we have it set to drop it, we're showing a drop of these and a pass of these rules. So you get the idea of going back and forth. Now you can get to that fine grain filtering and understand, especially like I said, these are going to be control machines what they're doing and how they're doing it so you can get to these fine details on here. What else can we do with that? Well, we go here and we'll do that iperf again. And one of the things iperf has an option of doing is both hit C for this and it's working over TCP. But you can actually do iperf over UDP. So you just add the U option. So now it's doing it over UDP, which actually gives you a little bit more performance because it uh, doesn't need a three-way handshake for each packet, but you can see it was working. Let's go over here, services, firewall, rules, bridge, edit this again now. We're only going to allow TCP connection. Save, apply. So now the only thing that can cross here is TCP connections. So we'll try it first with standard TCP. No problems, we're able to go across there. And then we'll do dash U for UDP. And that's it. Now you notice I do get accepted connection from, but it doesn't fi finish. We'll do that one more time. Accept a connection. That's because the connection is initialized via TCP, port 5201, but then UDP as the transport to try and do the test. And if we go over here, status, system logs, firewall, and you can see how it was dropping those connections that are coming in there. So it's trying and dropping away. So that's how you would control the firewall rules within there. And once again, and let's actually run a repetitive test because it, it's, you notice me flipping through here is causing it to heat up a little bit. So let's go ahead and we'll do this while that's running. See if this thermal management gets in there. But you can see with this running, it pushing this, it doing this right here where you hit, what, 144. I'm just bringing this up to uh, show you know, based on use case here that yes, it's stable. Yes, it will get warm if we keep doing this. And we'll do a few more times. 148, can we overheat it? 
not likely. And like I said, we're pushing it harder than it would probably likely be pushed with there. But I mean, it does push the CPU pretty hard. Uh, we're at about 50% of only two gigs of RAM usage. So you can see that one, even with Sericata, with more rules than are likely to be loaded in a real world scenario, because I loaded 100% of the rules, uh, we're still only at half RAM usage. We are pushing the temperature a little bit in the CPU usage. And you can see the peaks in the LAN and WAN. And ideally, when you're watching traffic, you're only going to really want to watch traffic over the bridge interface because LAN has one half, OPT has half, bridge shows all the traffic. Uh, so you can see the traffic going back and forth. But it's really reasonable as far as how fast the traffic goes across. And it quickly, as soon as we slow down, lowers back down to 139. And my office is at about, let's say, 70 degrees ambient temperature. So kind of an average, comfortable office uh, temperature. So nothing, nothing too extreme here. But hopefully this shows kind of the use case and how you would uh, deploy one of these and how you would configure one of these and whether or not they're viable. And of course, one of the questions that a lot of people want to know is, why are you choosing SG3100? And this goes back into the use case this client has. They need to deploy a large quantity of these. One of the things you can do with PSSense is go through, create the config file, create all the tuning for these type of systems. And there's going to be a quantity of these deployed at all the different locations. Uh, modify the file, do all the tuning, do everything, and then now you can easily duplicate it and in going into that XML file and only changing, for example, like if you set the management IP to be static, you could then set the XML file, change the management IP of each one, or set it to be DHCP and, and you know create reservations in there depending on which way you're going to deploy them. But now all once you configure one machine in your lab and build it out, you then can deploy this universally to all the machines. And as far as if there was ever a problem or a replacement needed to be done, no problem. Same with when you have to make a modification, you can then push this XML file to all those machines. And there's ways if you did things like if you want to get a little more complicated, SSH and Ansible, you could push these configs out via that via uh, in there and enforce a restart of all these machines and tell them to use the new config file. You could go real in depth with this, but this is one of the advantages when you use common hardware. And I know this is the NetGate box, but because they're going to all be the same, we can easily just drop that config file in each of these and rebuild it uh, very quickly. So we make the change in the lab and without having to go read through, especially if there's like 30 changes, you just re-upload the XML file to it, it'll restart and away you go. As always, if you wanna keep the discussion going, head over to our forums. And if you have questions, concerns, and comments, go over there and post them, thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.